doing things for us that we have no idea that you're doing for us even, Lord. And Lord, I ask that you bless each person here today. Open up their ears, open up their eyes, help them to see you, help them to grow in you, Lord, help them to understand your word, and help them to connect with you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I just praise your blessed name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Remain standing if you can, sing some songs, or sit down if you want. So today we really do have communion Sunday. After I'd song Sunday. I got a couple of them. So we're going to 284, 284. <laughs>
your Bibles, Job chapter 40, and I'll also be putting it up here on the screen too. It's good to look at your own Bibles too. You get different versions of things. I'm using the NASB, but there's a lot of other great translations too, and it's always hard to capture the actual translation of a different language there. So different translations and things that help you out with that. They're all made by scholars who have really looked at what does that word mean. And uh, you can only put one or two words in for each word. Sometimes it describes a little more than that. But Job chapter 40 is we're going to see, I, I read this illustration, I really liked it. There's, I guess the Cirrus Tower is like super enormous. It has like 4.5 million square feet or something with gross square feet. I guess that means like every square foot in space or so. But, but it's a big giant building. And you could stand at the bottom of a giant building and imagine looking up and looking and looking and just seeing for hundreds and hundreds of feet this mass of concrete and how big it is. And you would, might feel like you might fall down or something. And then I remember in the military, we were always jumping out of planes and doing stuff from extreme heights. You can get that feeling too if you're looking down for something super steep. Imagine you're all the way at the top of the tallest building you can think about, and there's just but a little bar or something, and you're looking over. Whoa, and you get that overwhelming feeling. That's kind of what God is about to do to Job. He's going to give him that overwhelming feeling of, I'm God, and you're this little small guy. You're but a speck of dust, and here I am as God. And so it's something to be awestruck with God's majesty. And, and he's going to expose Job as a finite creature. Job isn't like God. God is infinite. God knows everything. Uh, now, Job was a great guy. Okay, you might think, if you come to this sermon, and you hadn't heard the rest, you're going to think I'm talking bad about Job. Job was the most incredible man of the times. He was the greatest man in the East. Nobody on earth served God and loved God more than Job did at the time when Job was there. But... With all the suffering that happened to Job, God allowed the devil to kill all ten of his children, to take everything that he had, to give him a terrible disease, stripped him of everything that he ever could think of. Job felt that God was unjust, and several times accused God of injustice and demanded a trial by God, a trial with God, that he could say his say-so and God would say his say-so. Well, he's getting his trial now, but it's not going to turn out like what he thought, okay? But God is giving him this trial. And there is some irony and sarcasm that God uses too, we'll see in this chapter. And, uh, and God, Job is going to be challenged by God to do a better job at running the world. And some of you may have seen that Jim Carrey movie, Bruce Almighty, where all of a sudden he's like put in charge to run the world and, and it's overwhelming for him and he can't keep up with it and all this stuff's going on. It's almost like, I bet you... Whoever made that movie, maybe they knew their Bible a little bit and read this verse in Job 40 where, you know, he offers and he goes, so if you were in charge, what would you do? If you were in charge, how would you handle this is really what we're going to see. And, and we're going to see that God's going to destroy retribution theology. And I tell you, I think it's the natural human trait. Maybe we all fall into a time. Retribution theology means like if I do a good job, God's going to reward me. If I do good, God will do good by me. That is retribution theology, and that is not how the world always works. Okay? Thankfully, sometimes it's the way it works, but a lot of times what we do is we tend to take that sometimes and try to make it all the time. And God was not punishing Job with suffering because of something that he'd done. You know, we read several times, three times in the first two chapters of Job, that Job hadn't done anything wrong. Job was blameless, upright, incredible man. But there was a purpose why God was doing all the suffering, why God was allowing all these things. And it wasn't because he'd done some horrible sin like his three friends had said. And God's going to crush that retribution theology. And Job, even though he fought hard against his friends, he seems like the way he demanded justice from God and wanted to know why is God treating me so unjust, that he was also kind of clinging back to that retribution theology. So God's going to try to clear that up for him. He doesn't try to, he does do it. And Job needs to learn that the issue is not ethical, the question is not why, and the need is not understanding. The issue is spiritual, the question is who, and the need is trust. 
I found it. It's really good for summarizing this, isn't it? You know, it's not about it's not about ethics and why, you know, and it's not about how do I understand this. It's about it's a spiritual thing, and it's about who, which is God, and the need to trust God. Trust God no matter what, no matter what happens in life. We've got to trust God. The saddest thing in life can ever be is when somebody runs into such a terrible pickle in life, such a terrible trouble in life, and they just give up on God. You know, they do. And I tell you, if you listen to people talk, when people use the Lord's name in vain, I almost want to say, oh, I'm glad that you believe in God so strongly <laughs> that you're saying God cursed this. Or, you know, you're using God's name in vain, but automatically you're blurting this out to God. I'm glad you recognize that God is the one that's in charge. I'm glad you do that. But it does pain me to hear the Lord's name used in vain. But isn't it amazing how people who are so far from God will use the Lord's name in vain so quickly and so easily? Even our own selves. Maybe we'll cry out sometimes like, God, why? God. And But, but, but there's a healthy balance there as well. And I really believe that uh, the healthy balance, knowing the book of Job and seeing this, can help us so much. Because we do read a third of the Psalms has the psalmist questioning God, demanding uh, good things from God, demanding help from God, demanding, demanding that something be done about the wicked from God, and talking about how bad things are. And that's part of the Bible. God's put that there for us. We should connect with it and see it and feel those emotions too. But as the end of the end draws near, we're not left at the Psalms of Lamentation. We're not left in the brokenness. At the end, we're left with trusting God no matter what and finding peace and knowing that He is in control. He knows exactly what He's doing. So it's like the journey. we got to go through the journey to get to the end point. But I know a lot of people... I'm a chaplain. I know a lot of chaplains who will just stay there in the book of the Psalms and stay there in the misery and the cries for pain, but never go any farther, even for their own theology. I mean, it's good if they stay there with somebody who's at that point in life to stay there with the suffering and things. But eventually, you hope that they can get up from that point, and if your own theology stops right there and doesn't go farther, that you can really trust God, then you're in trouble. There was a guy that wrote a book. Uh, the Rabbi Kushner, is that his name? I may have a little bit off. But he wrote a book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it was a very popular book. But that book has a very bad end theology to it. It says that God just doesn't control everything. God doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean for all these bad things to happen because he just can't control everything. And that's what the Rabbi Kushner comes to for his answer for why is there evil and suffering in the world and all this stuff. And that is completely unbiblical, far from biblical. Even from Old Testament, as a Jewish guy, far from biblical to come to that end conclusion. And here in Job, we're coming to the end conclusion. So don't, if you're just coming into this, don't think, golly, man, that just sounds so hard and cold and how God speaks to this guy. God let him go through quite a journey for quite some time. God let him lament. God heard his cry before he comes to him with this end answer. And all of that is part of the beauty, is part of the journey that God has us on right here. So, so think about all that as you put this together. And, uh, and that's why I like, you know, it's not about all the why and ethical and I want to know what's going on. It's a spiritual issue. It's about God and that we need to trust God. So with that, we'll get started. It's going to be a little shorter than last week. Let me tell you, I told my wife that. It's a little shorter. Last week, it kind of took a little long. All right, the first five verses, all right, in these two first slides. We covered them last week, but I thought it's important that we kind of reconnect back with them a little bit. It says, Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer. So God's calling Job the fault finder, that he's finding fault with God himself. And no, nobody can find fault with God. None of us can. If we think we can, we don't understand how big God is. You know, we don't understand how small we are. We don't understand how infinite He is and how finite we are. We just can't even comprehend some things about God. I think we're only scratching at the surface of everything we know about God, even with the whole Bible and everything. God is so much bigger than we can ever imagine. Okay? The Bible is completely true. The Bible is all about God, but it's just starting to scratch the surface right there. And 
even as you read the Bible. Every time I read it, I learn more things. You know, I could never just read it once and think I got it all. You know, I, I talked to a guy yesterday. He told me he read the Bible 20 years, 20 times. I thought, wow, so impressive. I was really appreciative of this fellow. And he was a different denomination. He was not Protestant. But I still appreciate it. I said, no, I have new respect for you. I really do. I said, I saw you this way. Now I can really respect you in a deeper way. I said, that's beautiful. But there is so much truth in the Bible. It said, I wrote the top, God tells the sufferer that he got nothing wrong. Okay? Because, uh, because that's what the, the sufferer is trying to tell, tell Job, that he has something wrong. So God's letting him know, hey, I have got nothing wrong. Everything that happened to you, there's been a perfect reason for it. There's been a perfect purpose for it. You know, you're the fault finder. Tell me why. You know, let me hear the fault. And God's speech cuts us down to size to know his place and our place. He does entertain the trial. This is where the trials entertain. God entertains the trial that, uh, that Job demanded that he have a trial with God. But it doesn't go as Job thought. It's not able to go as Job thought because God just kind of opens up a little bit of light and Job's like, oh my. And then there's going to be two confessions of Job. At the end of this one, well, right here, we see one confession is Job is going to acknowledge that he shouldn't have said what he said, that he spoke too far, that he should have shut his mouth a long time ago. And that's basically, that's basically uh, repentance is what we're seeing with Job here. But what we're also going to see, not this week, but maybe next week or the week after, probably two more weeks still in Job, so I don't overload you. But we'll see in a couple weeks with Job, he's going to have a, a profession of confession where he's going to confess God. And truly, that's what we do. we got to repent and we have to believe. Repent and believe. Every time the gospel is going to be the gospel, any time a right response is going to happen, it always has to be repent and believe. Repent and believe. So we're going to see Job. He repents here. He says, I never should have said what I said. He says, then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken and I will not answer. Even twice and I will add nothing more. So he's basically saying, I've already spoken way more than I ever should have spoke, God. I'm sorry and I've shut my mouth. And, he, and that insignificant means, God, I am small. God, I am small. And think about that picture I told you about standing before that giant colossal building, the skyscraper, right at the bottom of it. Oh, man, you feel like you're going to fall down. Or if you've ever been at the top of things, extreme heights, and you look down, you're like, whoa, oh, oh my, <laughs> you know, my life is in serious danger type of thing. Like, you know, am I going to be able to be in control? You feel like you're out of control. That's how Job felt probably as he came to this conclusion. And then it says, then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, all right, so God's going to answer him. And basically the two questions God's going to get to in this passage is who am I and who are you? That's what God's going to point out and I bet you, I can almost guarantee you that all of us when we come to salvation, we come to believe in the Lord Jesus, first we had to figure out who we were, we had to figure out that we're sinners, we're fallen, that we're desperate for God and that we, we're not God ourselves and that we need His help, we need a Savior and that's where the who am I is going to come in and the who are you is that God is that Savior, and God is complete, and God is whole, and God's incredible, and there's no holes in God. There's no, there's no mistakes in God. Not one single mistake. Not one of us can say we don't have a mistake. Not one of us can say we're perfect. If we can say that, we've got to reevaluate ourselves. We stick with the who am I. <laughs> okay? But truly, we can't, and God's going to show this to him. So he answers him out of the storm. And he had a storm of life going on, remember? He had all his kids dead. He had his disease all over his body. He had his friends accusing him of being a, being a terrible heretic, an awful sinner, and it's all his fault. He had one friend that kind of brought him toward this conversation that was a little better. But uh, that's with the storm of life that he's in. And we get into storms of life too. We sure do. It says, Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Several times in the Bible it says this. I was like, it's like, stand up like a man. Stand up like a man and face this issue. And he says, 
Job will learn, I wrote, Job will learn that there are many aspects of God that he cannot understand. God's going to ask him a ton of questions. He's not going to know an answer for any of it. Last week, if you were here, we talked all about creation, how God made creation and God made all these things to be and how does all this stuff happen, how do the stars hang and the sun and the moon, all this kind of stuff go on and Job didn't have a clue. Now he's going to go down into the creature, all right? And we're going to talk about this creature called the behemoth. And he, he's, this is actually, this passage we're about to go into, this is like irony or sarcasm. It's God with sarcasm against Job. If you don't understand that, it won't make sense and you won't be able to really read it well. All right, so he says, I'll ask you and you instruct me. So he's saying, okay, Job, you're going to teach me some things. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? So he's asking Job, like, are you going to say that everything that I've done and judged is wrong? Are you going to, are you going to judge me? And are you going to be justified after condemning me? Truly, that's what Job was doing. Truly, it's what we do when we question God. We're judging Him. We're questioning the justice that God has done. And the speech is concerned with God's justice. The last was God's rule. You know, last, last time how God made everything was God's speech. Job is puzzled, but has no place to reprove God. So even though we might be at a loss and not understand why whatever's happening in our life happens, it doesn't give us a place to reprove God. And like I said, like I said, I tampered before, taper before is, is the Psalms indeed are puzzled. Some guy that's in puzzled and in pain and he's crying out to God. But here in the end, the end state of all of that is that we got to trust him and know that he's perfect and he's got it all. And we do have to go through our feelings and our emotions. We can't just sweep them away. Because it's not that easy. We're human beings and we have to feel and we have to experience what we experience. Or do you have an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like His? And this arm like God is like if you remember Isaiah 53. Maybe we'll read it today when we do communion. But it says, you know, the arm of the Lord is not too small. It's not too weak. You know, the arm of the Lord can save. There's another passage in Isaiah that says that about the arm of the Lord. And the arm is a symbol of strength. You know, it says in the Bible that God is a spirit. You know, when I think of what does God the Father look like, what's God the Holy Spirit look like, I don't think of like a man. I don't think of an image like the way we look. I don't think of that at all. Where is creation? We're what is made. But in order for Him to help us to understand, to be able to connect with this mentality, He uses personification of himself, like an arm of different things, okay? Does Jesus have an arm? Absolutely does. Jesus became man. God became man and dwelt among us. And Jesus is in the resurrected body. I think Jesus' eternal, eternal state is his resurrected body because it's his own choosing and it's the way that he connects to us. And indeed, it's a way of extreme love that God would contain himself within a creaturely body and do that for us to be able to connect to us, to love us. I mean, really think about the depth of that, that God became man. It's not like a man came down and became another man. You know, God, who was you know, not a man, became man in order to show us, to die for us, to suffer for us, and to, to, to reconcile us back to himself. But he tells him, he says, Do you have an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? It's a challenge. He's saying basically, can you judge the world, Job? Can you judge the world like I judge the world? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty. So he's saying, Job, why don't you put on my judge's wig, okay, and gown so you look so splendid. I don't know if you've ever looked at like the old movies of the old American stuff in the 1700s and they all had the wigs. I think George Washington didn't really have like a wig and all those guys. And, and you think of those judges in the big fancy gown. He's saying, hey, put all this stuff on. Be the, oh, you look so good, Joe. Put all that stuff on. You look so good. He's saying, he's, he looks so splendid. Why don't you put on all this stuff, Joe? So like I said, there's a lot of irony, a little bit of sarcasm God's using. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and make him low. So he's telling Joe, you know, Make all these proud people low. Take care of them. Put them back in the place where they need to be. And, uh, and let your anger overflow. 
in the way you know that righteous anger would overflow. He's saying he's saying let your anger at injustice flow. Bring the wicked down. The implication though here is that Job should start with himself. That's the sarcasm, the irony. Is that Job is trying to sell God these things, and God reverses it on him. And the and what Job should be understanding from this as he listens to God once again is, oh my, what have I done when I questioned the justice of God? What have I done when I wanted a trial with him? What have I done when I thought I knew better on how things should be than the way God has made things to be? So that's how God is speaking to him. He says, look on everyone who is proud and humble him and tread down the wicked where they stand. So he's telling Job to do this stuff. And he's saying, your angry speeches don't seem to be doing anything, Job. Run the world better, you know. And, uh, and Job was saying that God had not done this. There's several verses. I didn't list them here because I don't have much space in my little thing and can't remember everything. But there's several verses in the 20 chapters that Job speaks that he questions God's justice and he calls God unjust. And that was where Elihu called Job out, which was more beautiful with Elihu than his friends. His friends were saying, Job, you are suffering because of your sin. Elihu was saying, because of your suffering, you have sin. And indeed, I bet all of us do. I bet we're more susceptible to suffering and sinning than we are the other way around. You know, it's, it's tough. It's not easy to go through suffering. So it says, hide them in the dust together. Bind them in the hidden place. This is what he's telling Job to do. And this would be referring to, like Jude 6, put them into eternal chains under the, under the gloomy darkness. Which is what God does with those that, that aren't his own, those that don't follow him. You know, we Also, Isaiah 2.12 says this exact representation as well, too. So that's one thing beautiful about the Word of God is we see it popping up all over the place, confirming itself, and in different areas of time. Like maybe Job was written in 3500 B.C., and maybe Jude 6 was written in, I don't know, somewhere before 180. And yet we see the same words being spoken all the time. I tell you, I found out once as I was studying Job that a ton of the Psalms match perfectly to the book of Job. And people will try to say that don't believe the Bible. That's because Job was written after the book of Psalms. But that's not true at all. Because there's a lot of things in Job that bring it way back from the time of Abraham. Even who Job was, you can connect to his family in the days of Abraham, the days of Genesis. What that shows is that the Word of God is the Word of God. Truth is true. And it shines through. And it's beautiful and it's amazing. But we can see that here as he, he tells them, like, give them the judgment. Give them the eternal judgment. Put them away in the hidden place. Then I will also confess to you that your right hand can save you. So God says, if you could do all those things, then I will say that you can save yourself, Job. Then I'll say that. Imagine the irony. Imagine the, the fear poor Job has as he hears God tell him these things. Imagine the fear you would have if God told you this and said, you think you can do it better? all these things and you're going to do this better right and then he goes then you can save yourself right and we're not going to be able to save ourselves that's part of the who am i we realize that we can't save ourselves and so he said i put at the top that i will admit you're right and conceive and it's like that movie bruce almighty like i said you know we have the fellow the black actor who's god and and jim carrey and you see and you see that it's just too much for jim carrey and he's dropping the ball left and right all over the place and you know, I'm not saying it's like a, a fine Christian movie. I'm just saying it's kind of like the situation that's going on right here. And he's telling them, then you can just save yourself, Job. But we know we can't. Behold now, behemoth, which I made as well as you, he eats grass like an ox. Now, behemoth, this is a mystery. And so is the next chapter that I'm going to say next week. Truly, this is the second speech of God, and it goes through the next chapter. But that's another 34 verses, and that would be too much to pile on you in one day. <laughs> so, behemoth is, is, is amazing, and, it's, and if you look to what does the Hebrew word of behemoth mean, it's a plural word of majesty. It's the, what, may, what we may say is that it's the super beast. Super beast is what we might be able to take from the Hebrew language with the word behemoth as to what does this word mean in our language. And... And he has a hearty, insatiable appetite, we're going to see. Like he doesn't, 
I mean, he could just wolf stuff down and gobble stuff up, the behemoth. And who is the behemoth? This is the big question. I personally think the behemoth could be the beast of the time of the book of Revelation. The behemoth could be the representation for death itself. Behemoth could be what you read about in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13. And truly there is a, they call it an unholy trinity with the false prophet, the beast, and the, and the, uh, and the, and the dragon. You know, the dragon, the devil himself right there. And they call it like an unholy trinity and you can see a lot of connections with the behemoth and Leviathan with the devil, with this false trinity, with this darkness and super evil type of power. And truly as we read through this, even the book of Job, he says that he made the behemoth first, that it was his first creation. And I mean, all these kind of things kind of go to it. And then the majority of scholars are going to say that this behemoth is a hippopotamus. They say, well, he must be like a hippopotamus, okay? Because we read some things that make it sound like a hippopotamus, but we're also going to read some things that it's not like a hippopotamus. And even with the Leviathan next week, we read like he spits fire like a dragon out of his mouth. He does things that are just tremendously different than any creature we have ever known. Even dinosaurs, as far as we know, we don't know of the dinosaurs breathing fire from their mouth. We don't know of all these other kind of things that we're going to read about. So it's like this mystery creature. But yet Job must have understood more about it than what we understand about it. Because we struggle a bit. It doesn't sound like Job struggled. God told him right there. But if you think about it, if you believe what the Bible says, I believe the Bible says Adam lived 930 years or something, like this long span of time. Okay, Noah lived like 900 years. All these guys spanned out. Within Job's time, it was just a few generations from the beginning of creation. Imagine how much these guys would have known from talking to your grandpa, talking to your great-grandpa, talking to your family. It would have been a lot more than what we would have known. And maybe that had right there in that knowledge too, you know, the dark one of, of, the, of the evil, of the trouble right here. But maybe it is a hippopotamus. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I, I tend to think it's more tied up with like Revelation 12 to 13. If you read that and about the beast, it calls it the beast over and over again. It calls behemoth the beast over and over again here. And there's a lot of uh, likeness that we're going to see. Because even, because it's going to call behemoth untamable, that he can't be tamed. You know, we have hippopotamuses in zoos. Sure, we may not be able to go pet them to play with them or something, but they're in a zoo. You know, I looked at some ancient pictures and it showed Egyptians in a little canoe with, with spears trying to stick and shish kebab those hippopotamuses that are at the bottom of the river that were standing there. And I thought, I bet they did sometimes, you know. I bet some of them died doing it too. But I bet some of them could get it. But this, this one sounds a little bit more than what we could actually, you know, manhandle and grab a hold of it and make for food or something. So it's... It's very interesting here. And also, this behemoth will also would connect, and same with the Leviathan, would connect as a symbol of chaos with Egyptian mythology. And I know a lot of people don't like to think about Egyptian mythology. I first, when I first got introduced to it some, I thought, oh, what the heck is this pagan type of stuff? But truly, if you look at Egyptian mythology, it, a lot of it lines up with similarities to the Bible to such an extreme that I understand that, that that wasn't first, it may have been written first some of it, but it didn't come about first, that it was a diluted, twisted truth of what was reality from the pagans. You know, they learned and knew this stuff from the first men that were there, and then they changed it to their own things with Egyptian mythology. And I, I had it in seminaries, not, that's just not me, just little old me thinking this. There's books and books about how ancient mythology, Egyptian mythology, so perfectly proves the Bible to be true because it's not just coming from one people group, it's coming from all kinds of people groups. Even the flood, the flood, every single ancient culture you can find has a flood in their history. Every one of them. You know, they have different reasons for the flood or different sayings, but the flood appears. What's the coincidence that all that goes on? The coincidence is that it really did happen. And that over time, they changed to make it try to be like they want it to be like. 
But in reality, it was the judgment of God. It was the flood. And that also connects with Behemoth and Leviathan as well, if you get deep into this and the studying about these guys. It says, Behold now, his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. So he's saying he's full of energy and he's full of strength. And this is like a powerful creature. He bends his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. Now this could be a tail, but there's children and things, so I don't want to go too in depth. But if you read the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, or the Syrian, it's called the Syriac. It's another translation of the Bible. It doesn't say tail here. Okay, that's where I'll just leave it right there. It says something else about this beast, all right? But what it does symbolize, no matter what, everybody's agreed on this, tremendous strength and fertility. That's what it symbolizes about this, about this beast. It multiplies himself. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. And bones and limbs as strong as bronze and iron are incredible. You know, think about that. If your bones and your limbs were as strong as iron and bronze, like superheroes, you know, we try to look at Marvel and DC, some of those guys are super powerful, but God is describing this guy as that, this creature. He is the first of the ways of God. Let his maker bring near his sword. So here I say, he's first of the ways of God. He was made first, which I believe, a lot of people believe too, that the devil was possibly the first creation that God made was the devil. He was the most powerful creature God ever made was the devil and yet he is nothing in comparison to God he's not dualistic he's not on the level with God he was made by God God made him for a purpose God made him to use God can snuff him out with the sword when he will and it does in Revelation 19 15 Jesus is coming back and there's a sword coming out of his mouth and he just flushes out all of these things right there they're gone you know the the unholy trinity, two of them are thrown in the lake of fire, and the devil himself is put into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. And how do you know the lake of fire is eternal? It's because later when the devil's thrown in the lake of fire, it says with the, 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 the two others right there of the unholy trinity. So they're still there a thousand years later. It's not just a, an idea that it's just annihilation. It's not just an annihilation. But we can see that God made this guy first, and then... Only God can draw near to him. No one else can approach him. Which tells me, I don't know, because a hippopotamus, we can capture him. We can put him in a zoo. You know, we can eat him. I don't know what people do with hippopotamuses. I do know they're dangerous. I was in Africa once, and we were looking for the wildlife on like our own little time off. And the African guy that was there, he said, oh, watch out for the hippopotamus. He was terrified of elephants, and he was terrified of hippopotamuses. And he said, they are vicious, and they are mean, and you don't want to get anywhere near them. And we did find a wild elephant, and he got real scared that we were taking our pictures with the elephant behind us. It's like, get in the vehicle, come on, let's go. Well, we saw him on the side of the road like a rabbit or a deer type of thing. And then we did go far, far into the bush to this like hunting type land and there was there was like an English white guy there with a weird accent that I don't know he spent his whole life hunting giant game and we talked to him on the hill and he said that there was a hippopotamus like if you keep walking you can't just get there with a the car down here there there and we thought well, maybe we shouldn't go all the way down there in the middle of this jungle type of thing and it was almost like 7 p.m. it was starting to get dark so we didn't do it but hippopotamuses are dangerous, but people do take them down. People do get them. Here it says, let his maker bring near his sword. Surely the mountains bring him food, and all the beasts of the field play there. So he's saying food is a way to appease him. He's always hungry. I think, once again, like the uh, Clash of the Titans type of thing, is that you know everybody's going to bring him some food to keep the, 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 the grogan or whatever, the, the giant monster appease to keep him away from killing everybody else type of picture so he's he's showing this magnificence with this beast is what god's doing for job under the lotus plants he lies down in the convert of the reeds and the marsh so this is where they think you know maybe a hippopotamus because they might like hide out you know and just stay down low in the weeds uh but as i said that the egyptian mythology this would be considered Mot, the god of death. 
is Egyptian theology, and they would call the god of death Moat. And that also, there's a lot of similarities if you look at Egyptian theology and you look at what the book of Job says about this guy, to this guy Moat, the god of death. And the sea beast is what also, it looks like, like I said, you read Revelation 13, the whole chapter, which is a pretty powerful chapter. In that chapter, it says the number of the beast is 666. That's that chapter right there, and it really describes the beast. And it says he's always there. He is always there. And that and that's how God is saying, too, that this creature is there. And he's asking Job, like, can you take care of this creature, this, this, this massive monster that I made? Can you handle him? So it says, the lotus plants cover him with shade. The willows of the brook surround him. And if you ever think, because I guess hippopotamuses, if you look at a picture, you can see that. But I actually lived in Florida. And maybe some of you guys, I know some of you guys have been to Florida. I know Mike went to Florida recently back then. But in Florida, you could be golfing or something, and there's all these lakes, and you're looking for your golf ball by the lake, and all you see are two eyes sticking out of the water. And you think, I better let that golf ball go. <laughs> I don't want to mess with it. There are literally alligators like rabbits hanging out in Florida in almost every regular body of water with no cages or anything. Somebody told me recently, well, I read it on the news on my little phone. It said, it said some lady, you know, coming out of this COVID-19, that she got had a hairdresser come to her house, and the hairdresser saw there was an alligator, you know, right by her house, and she went over to see the alligator, and the woman that lived there said, no, no, don't do that. Right where you're standing, the alligator killed a deer just the other day, just snatched it and took it away. And the lady said, do I look like a deer? And oh. she even went to pet the alligator. Oh, no. And when she did that, the alligator took her into the water. Three times she came up, there was thrashing going on around. The third time she came up, she was laying face down and the alligator was just laying there with his teeth on her leg, just like hovering as well. And the police came and had to shoot the alligator a couple of times to get the alligator to move away. And they pulled the woman in and she then survived. And and that's a horrible picture. But I could totally see it today with so many people that think the wildlife is so tame and it's so okay to play with. Sometimes it's not. There are things in life we should be careful of and there should be danger and we should stay away. So if you go down to Florida and you see those alligator eyes hanging out by the lake, don't get too close, okay? <laughs> they can move pretty quick and they're much more powerful than we are. In fact, the same people who would say as biblical scholars that the Behemoth is the Leviathan. We'll say that the Leviathan is the crocodile. That's what they'll say. Behemoth is the hippopotamus, and the Leviathan is a crocodile. That's what they'll say. But I think it's much more than that because we have some verses that don't connect with a, with a regular beast and a regular uh, crocodile as we look at this. If a river rages, he is not alarmed. He is confident, though the Jordan rushes into his mouth. And I could, they picture this as a hippopotamus because imagine if the rivers just soared down. I mean, we've had some bad rains here in the last month or so. Some people's basements even flooded a little bit or got some water in them and things. And you could just imagine how heavy these rivers are going. If you drove by the metro parks, you could just see the tremendous power. And this beast, the picture is just sitting there in the midst of everything flying toward it. It's not even moved. It doesn't even get phased by it, all right? And then... My own little picture of understanding what makes me think of things is I love that book, The Pilgrim's Progress. If you have not read it, I suggest it. If you need a copy of it, I'll give you a copy to read. I think I own a lot of the <laughs> copies of The Pilgrim's Progress. I bet you I've bought 50 copies of that through my time, but I've given away most of them. But I have at least 10 of them still, so by all means, you want one, I'll give you one. But in The Pilgrim's Progress, the last place of the Christian's journey is across the River Jordan. And the River Jordan symbolizes death. It's the river of death. It's something that we all must experience before we get to the promised land. And it's scary. And it's dark. And it's nothing that any of us are feeling warm and fuzzy about. You know, nobody truly when they come down. We may ideology thing and say, oh yeah, I'm going to be just fine. But I tell you, I'm with people that die all the time. And it's not. It's a hard place. It's a hard place, and I always tell people, just keep holding on to your faith no matter what. Hold on to your faith. And I tell them, I, I tell them, I say, the Word of God promises, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to go through this death, and you're going to be present with the Lord. And it's all going to be over, and there'll be no more trials, no more suffering, no more bad valleys, but it's very hard to face. And picture this, 
This creature is just swallowing up death, death himself. It's just rushing toward him, and to him, it's not a, it's not, doesn't phase him a bit. He's confident. Can anyone capture him when he is on the watch with barbs? Can anyone pierce his nose? And uh, so, like I said, can people capture the the real one? Yeah, they can capture the real hippopotamuses, you know. It, even people back then, you know, there's ancient pictures of the Egyptians with their little spears and their tiny little floating boats. <laughs> I should have put it up there. I was comical, <laughs> but I thought, I bet it really did happen. You know, they wrote the little pictures on how they did things. And the hippopotamuses are walking on the bottom of the thing. But it's untamable. So, I'm going to summarize all this. And, and uh, the picture of the summary of this is, the question is, are you in submission to Christ's Lordship? Are you his servant? That's a big picture today. Right now, right here, for every one of you where you sit today, how does this apply directly to me? Job chapter 40 is, are you in submission to Christ's Lordship? Or do you think that you can tell God a better way to do things? Do you think that what's happened to you should never have happened to you, whatever it is in life? That, that God, that why would God, you know, I could tell God how to do things better with me. I could, I could manage my life a lot better than the way God's managed my life. And that's really what it comes down to here. And the biggest question is, are you his servant? You know, are you like Job? Do you, do you realize today, read, hearing this chapter, uh, thinking about God on your own, previous times reading the Bible, do you realize that you don't have anything to say to God to tell him what to be or how to be or anything? In reality, God's got it all. Do you realize that he is your salvation, that he has the arm to save, that nobody else has the arm to save but Christ alone. There's no other way to heaven. There's no other way to healing. There's no other way to forgiveness outside of Jesus Christ. If you think there are, you're ultimately kind of being where God was saying he thought Job was going with his pride, that he thought that he had some other way, that he thought he could make it a better way. And that's what we shouldn't do. And it says, uh, three questions, do I ever contend with God? You know, I'm sure you do. You know, we contend with God in our prayer just like the psalmist contends with God in his prayer. But at the end, we've got to realize this end point, this end point that, Job, that God talks to Job about. Do I ever question God's ways? Do I mean, like, why, God, why would you do this? Why would you do that? Do I maintain a proper understanding of my insignificance before God? Do I remember that I am small and he is big? At the end of the day, that's very important that we have that. No matter what's going on, I am small, he is big, he is God, he's perfect, he is a good God, he's not a bad God. He is everything that the best of anything could ever be. We've got to trust that. And I wrote, we are always creatures who live within the Creator's world, so we must humbly accept our place in God's sovereign design for the world. We've got to accept our place, we've got to accept who we are as people. What appears to be God's injustice then is in reality the patience of redeeming grace. And this is in line with where Job several times said, look at the wicked and the wicked are thriving and the wicked's kids thrive and they die a good death and the kids are just fine and all this is great and yet the righteous man is living in the street, dirt poor, homeless, got nothing. And we have to remember that. God's patience is of his redeeming grace. Think about our own selves. If we, if God had dealt with us as we want him to deal with others who make us mad, we never would have come to salvation. We'd have been cut down long ago before salvation ever came. There is patience in God's redeeming grace. So next time you see somebody and you think that guy should be cut down, this and that should happen, that fellow, Think about God's redeeming grace. Think about your own self and think about the mercy of God and his patience. It's a beautiful thing and it's something that we all long for and desire. And sometimes it's hard for us to desire for somebody else. We end up just thinking about we want that for ourselves. But that other guy, he's got to pay. But we got to turn things around and try to picture picture the bigger picture right there. That the other guy, awesome. We got to think of redeeming grace and it's true. It brings us perfect to communion right now because that is what Jesus did. Jesus came as the suffering servant. He's going to come two times, the Bible says. Old Testament prophecy, they didn't differentiate that, okay? So even now, when we look in Revelation, the old end times, sometimes we've got a question, do I really know it all? 
okay? It's kind of like I'm looking through the glass darkly. I kind of perceive it. In the end, after it's happened, I'll be like, oh yeah, it's exactly like it said it was going to happen. But right now, it might be hard for us. The Jews, the people that lived before Jesus' time, they thought it was going to be a one-time fix-all. And it wasn't. Jesus came the first time as the suffering servant. He was God Almighty, took the form of a man, came into the human flesh, and was fully man and fully God. And he died and let people beat him and spit on him and tear out his hair and do terrible things to him. All because of his love for us. Because as he was on that cross, it says the Father, God the Father, dealt out the wrath, the punishment that every one of us deserved. And he put it on his own innocent son who never done anything at all and crushed him on that cross. So much that Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he felt separated from an eternal oneness that he's always had with God. You know, God is one. You know, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God is one. And yet separated from that oneness in that moment, in that time, as all the sin and the wrath of God, all the punishment for sin of our sins was thrust upon the Son on that cross. And he did it for us. And one thing we notice about Jesus, he never questioned God's justice. He didn't say, oh God, this isn't fair. Why would you do this to me, to your son? Why would you do that? He never questions that. He pleaded that if it could be another way, let it be another way. But he said, let not my will but your will be done. And he taught us to pray it the same way, that not my will, but your will be done. And he had the perfect picture, okay? Because Jesus was God. Jesus didn't have a place for a, a good talking to, like Job got at the end of the book for some of his ears and things, because he was perfect all the way, and he did it for us, and he suffered for us. And he's, to me, these 2,000 years since Jesus died, because he said he is going to come back soon. He says we are in the last days, but yet the Bible says a day could be as a thousand years of the Lord. In the last days, it's grace. It's grace upon grace. Because as you read your Old Testament Bible, you'll think we're a long overdue for a hard thrashing, mm -hmm. okay, for a hard judgment, bigger than what this world has seen with COVID-19, bigger than all these other things, and yet God is so merciful toward us. And, and truly, at the end of the day, after it's all said and done, I'm sure every one of us would be like, I'm so glad that God waited until the last person who would ever confess Him, who would ever believe in Him, came to salvation in Him before He wrapped up this project of man. Before, you know, I hit here and people call America now the experiment of America. And I think, golly, that's a terrible thing to say. We're pretty well founded in a couple hundred years, this American experiment. The thing about this the experiment of man, when all this is going to be wrapped up one day and it's going to be said and done with, it's going to be over. It's not going to go back again to man. It's not going to be any more people, not going to be any more chances. It's all going to be said and done. And because of that, we should be so thankful that God has so much grace. And we should feel like singing that song, Amazing Grace. How, how, how amazing it is that he saved a wretch like me. And that is how we should look at it, rather than, man, God's got to judge this guy. <laughs> you know, hopefully, let's pray that God will save that guy. Let's pray for our enemies. Let's pray for people. 